All right, okay, so we've come together for a Bible study today on uh, 25th of uh, February, 2023, All right? So uh, our study for today is about those that go with the 144,000. And it's based on that chart, that's chart number two. I can see it on the screen. So, because we are running behind time already, I did have a problem to join in, then we aren't gonna waste any more time. I'm just giving an introduction. Then I'm going to read a prayer thought, and then we're gonna have a word of prayer and then we can begin our study, right? So like I said, the title of our study is those with the hand and foot, for Southern, those with, right? So of course there'll be many other people that will join the first fruits, the hand and foot, for Southern, later, but of course our focus in right now and in this study is about those that will join the hand and foot for Southern from the church and they are leaving, okay? And they go with the hand and foot for Southern to set up the kingdom. So that's our focus in this study. So this is a study about that doctrine, the doctrine of those who go with the hand and foot for Southern who are leaving. So we want to ascertain that there will be those who will be saved with the hand of four thousand and from the church, uh, besides those that are to come from Egypt and from Assyria, and that will be later after the kingdom has already been set up. So this will be our study for today and this afternoon. So let me uh, read a prayer thought from answer the book number five, right? So if you have your books with you, you want to open page 29 of answer the book five, okay? And uh, I'll read paragraph three and four on this page. And it reads, but let your faith be not in miracles or in man's experience, but in the revelations of his prophetic word. That's paragraph two. So this is where we are to base our faith on the revelations of his, his It looks like we lost him. And I'll just keep on reading. And now the only safe and same procedure is to read closely every page of the solemn message contained in the Shepherd's Rod publications. Let not a line escape your attention. Study every word carefully and prayerfully. Be earnest and diligent in your perusal of truth and prove all things hold fast to that which is good. First Thessalonians 5, 21. And we're quoting answer number five, page 21, paragraph. I think he said it started with two. We'll just say two through four just to be safe. All right. Go ahead, Thank Brother you, Obi. Thank you, my sister. So, this is the, the right thing that we are supposed to do. Inspiration says the only safe and sane procedure, meaning the way we are to progress and proceed going forward in this spiritual battle, spiritual journey in which we are in, is to closely you know, read every page of the solemn. This message we bear is solemn. It says contained in the Shepherd's Road publication. So we are not to allow a line to escape our attention. We are to study, says every word, and we are to study it two ways, carefree and prayerfree. 
okay? We are to be earnest and diligent in our perusal or in our studies, because every word, every line matters. This is the way that God has put forth in his wisdom to cleanse, you know, his church. Okay, so uh, this is this this just our our prayer thought. So I'll ask that we bow down for a word of prayer. I hope everybody can hear me. All right, so let's have a word of prayer. Amen. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity that you have afforded us to study your Holy Word. We want to thank you for the technology of internet that is that is able to bring us together from various places you know millions thousands of kilometers away to gather together and study your word and as we begin the study for today we invite the holy spirit to be our guide and our teacher we want to understand the doctrine about those that are to go with the hand of the four thousand from the church. So let the Holy Spirit lead us into our truth that at the end of it all, we may have that understanding which we need and that your name will be glorified and that will be better Christians than we are much ready and fit to get the seal and the mark to be either one of or one with the 144,000 the first fruits. So this is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. We pray, amen. 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 All right, so there is, uh, in our attempt to ascertain the fact that there will be those that are to go with the 144,000. There's one particular reference from the road that, uh, that can actually clear out the whole matter, the whole issue about those that are to go with the 144,000. So we are going to read it together and I'll ask you to open that quote, it is from the Blue Book, volume two, number five, on page eight, paragraph one. So that's our very first quote in regard to this teaching, and it is very clear. All right, so if you are using the Blue Book, the large green book, I mean, Blue Book, it is on page. 202 I attempted to put these pages just in case somebody could be having those books uh, so I'm going to read this quote which is uh, to to a c5 page 8 it says all that all that are members of the church, up to the fulfillment of Ezekiel 9, will either receive the seal and be a part of or with the 144,000, or else be left without the seal and fall under the slaughter weapons of the five men, end of court. All right, so here we are told that all that are found members of the church up to the fulfillment of Ezekiel 9. Now, this issue of Ezekiel 9 helps us to understand what church is being talked about here. The church is Seventh-day Adventist, our church, upon which the fulfillment of Ezekiel 9 is to take place. And we all know 
that Ezekiel 9 is the purification of the church. Therefore, the church being talked of here is SDA church. Then it says those who, those who will be found members of this church up to the time of the purification of this church will either. Now, this word either means one of two, okay? Receive the seal and be part of or with the 144 Southern. So there are two positions. One can be sealed to be part of, and if you are sealed to be part of, it means that you are numbered among the 144 Southern. Or you can be sealed to be with the 144 Southern. So now if you are sealed to be with the 144 Southern, it means you are not numbered among them and yet you go with them. Then the remaining are those that will fall under the slaughter weapons, you know, uh, by the, by, I mean, of the five men of Ezekiel 9. So this one particular statement settles the whole controversy. Uh, it settles the whole issue as to whether there will be others that will go with the 144 Southern and certainly they will be there. It's, it's showing that there are those who are, those who are of, meaning they are part of the number and those who are with, meaning they are not part of the number but they go with the 144 Southern. So both of, and those with are going to escape the slaughter, which is the purification of the church. So there are living ones who will escape the slaughter together with the 144 Southern. This is very clear and I'm sure it's irrefutable. And uh, further, this very statement I've already pointed out, it splits the sealed people in the church into two classes. Okay, by the use of the word either, which means one of one of two, those sealed to be part of, okay, and those who be sealed to be, uh, rather, who be sealed as as one with the hand and foot for southern. All right, so this one reference that we read from the Blue Book, volume two, number five, and uh, page eight, it's very clear. Of course, we cannot take the need to be members of the church. It says those who are found members, these are the living people, okay? And they get the seal of Revelation seven, the seal of the living God, by the angel ascending from the east. That's the seal for those that are not to taste death. And it is clear that we'll have, we'll have two groups, those that will be sealed to be part of and those that will be sealed uh, as one with. So they are to go with the 144 Southern, though they are not numbered among the number, 144 Southern. All right. So having understood this difference i think the first thing that we want to do or the next thing we will do we want to know what started the controversy over this doctrine which i think is clear okay what started the controversy over this doctrine of those with uh that are to go with the hand and foot for southern so this doctrine of those with is based on the prophets of Zechariah 6. And on this chart, which is on the screen, chart number two, okay? This Zechariah chapter six prophecy is the basis of this uh, uh, doctrine. And uh, we are given the chart to make it easy for us to understand. So, we are all very familiar with that prophecy of two brass mountains 
and four chariots coming from between the two brass mountains. And the fourth and the last chariot, uh, you know, with the set, uh, two sets of horses, the bay and the grizzard, uh, represents the Seventh day Adventist, our church. Okay, so we find that both track number two and time regreeting volume two, number 22 actually deals with the prophets of Zechariah 6. So we are going to make use of these two booklets to make the study clear, to show that there will be those living that are to go with the 144,000 to set up the kingdom. So let's turn to track number two, and we want to read on page 39, there it's going to tell us um, about the bay horses. So if you have the booklet or you have the big book, you can open track number two, page 39, and we want to read paragraph one. It says, in view of this sad fact, now preceding, on the preceding page, it's talking about the angel of Laodicea, who is wretched, you know, poor, blind, you know, and naked, and I have since betrayed his trust. Okay. Now on page 39, it says, that's the sad fact. It says, in view of that sad fact that the angel of the church of Laodicea, the pastors of the church, uh, represented by the fourth chariot, being in that sad condition, God must have a second leadership to finish his greatest work since the world began. Okay, so this has stated that God should come up lost brother Obi. so i'm i'll continue reading of this second set of sermon servants we read and i saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living god and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels saying hurt not the earth neither the sea nor the trees till we have sealed the servants of our god in their foreheads and in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Revelation 7, verses 2 and 3 and 14. Revelation chapter 14, verse 5. And we're quoting track number 2, page 39, paragraph 1. Brother Obi, are you back yet? Yes. Okay, go ahead. All right. Thank you. You've just read the whole quote. All right. So we see that of, he says, it continues to say, of this second set of servants, we read, and then it quotes Revelation 7, verse 2 and 3, and Revelation 14, verse 5. And this is talking about the 144,000. So this is clear that. The second set of servants, those that came later as a result of the first set symbolized by the grizzled horses are the 144,000. Okay? So the bay represents the 144,000. Let's read from the tract. We want to go on page 45, and we just want to read a statement on paragraph zero, okay? Right on the top of the page, that's right. There it says, oh brother, sister, be not food. If this does not reach your heart now in time to be saved, 
uh, rather in time to save you from the evil to come, it will surely overtake you eventually, but then only to destroy, not to save you. So stay no longer with the grizzled horses in Egypt, for to do so will be only to perish there with them while the bay take the chariot to the promised land. All right, so end of quote. Here we see that it is actually addressing the passengers, the people in the chariot, the members of the Seventh-day Adventist, not to ignore this message of salvation, the last message of mercy to the church and later to the whole world. It says, if we ignore this message, then this will be overthrown and we will die with the grizzard that takes the church to Egypt, to worldliness. We know it from 5T, page 217. Egypt stands for worldliness. It says, while it says, stay no longer with the grizzled horses in Egypt, for to do so will be only to perish there with, with them, with the grizzled leadership, those we have just read about in, two, in, in, uh, yeah, in track number two on page 39. Okay, so it says, while the bay take the chariot to the promised land. So the bay, the 144,000, are going to take the chariot to the promised land. Okay, the bay horses represent the 144,000, and the passengers represent the lay members in the church. So they both escape the slaughter in the church. The bay will lead the, I mean, those with them, the members which are symbolized as, as passengers in the chariot. So this is what we read here in track number two. Let's read the time regreeing since 2TG number 22 also deals with the prophets of Zechariah, you know, six. Now, 2TG number 22, page 21. We want to read a statement on paragraph three. Here, the pen of inspiration uh, reads, and I quote, says, since the chariot are led by horses, the horses themselves must symbolize the chariots uh, church's leadership, okay? The horses represent the church's leadership and the passengers in the chariot must symbolize the laity. So there we have it. The symbolism that you are seeing on the screen has horses and two sets of horses that are pulling one chariot. And we are told that the fact that the horses are pulling the chariot, therefore the horses represent the church's leadership. And we have already read about the grizzard being those leader, the leadership of the church, the general conference that have betrayed their trust and they are leading the, the church to the world, okay? Whereas the bay represents the hand and foot for Southern. Remember when we read track number two on page 39, it quotes Revelation seven verses two and three in chapter 14 about the hand and foot for Southern. And we are told that these bay horses, which represents the hand and foot for Southern, will take the chariot to the promised land on track number, the, on the quote that we have just read on page 45. So they take those that who are to go with them and they are here symbolized by the passengers in the chariot. Okay, 
that chariot has two passengers, just like the two leadership. So there are those who are loyal to the grizzled horses. There are those who are following the bay horses. So there are two you know, classes of passengers in the chariot. These are living and not dead people. And it would be ridiculous for the 144,000 symbolized by the bay to take an empty chariot to the promised land or to take uh, dead passengers with them to the promised land. So this goes to show clearly that the passengers or the chariot which they take to the promised land is of the living people, those that are to go with them. Okay? So that's how we know that there will be some living people that will escape the slaughter of Ezekiel 9 and go with the 144,000 to set up the kingdom. This is what we understand and taught. This has been taught by all the workers, you know, since the days of the prophet. All right. So we are looking at what brought about the, con the, co the, the controversy over this doctrine. Now, it was one day in, 18, in 1982 that a minister went to New York from the, from the headquarters and he was presenting a study on Zechariah 6. Okay, that was in New York. And when he started, uh, he stated the fact that I've just okay. said. Hello? Are you there? Go yeah. ahead, Brother uh, Obi. If anybody yeah. is not muted, yeah. please mute. All right, I thought you had something to say. All right, so I'm just telling you how the controversy started. It was in the year 80, 1982, when uh, a study was being presented, it was in New York about Zachariah six. And then a brother stood up and said, no, there will be none with, there will only be 144,000 and no more. So that was the, uh, the first time we had a controversy over the doctrine of those with as you know, portrayed or given to us in the prophets of Zechariah 6. So that's what happened and that's how it started. And since then, uh, the, the brother that refuted the, the teaching and some who joined with him have been you know, teaching that there will only be 144,000 saved from the church and there will be none with. And uh, from that time, what they did, they broke off and went and set up their own organization in New York. It's still existing there. I'm sure you know about the, 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 the association in the White Plains, okay? So that's how the controversy over the doctrine of those with, you know, started. Okay, so next I want us to consider some of the things, you know, to prove that there are, uh, there are none, the, the, the things they say to prove that there will be no, none to go with the 144,000. Alex, you sure? Just your one? That's like a couple of days old. Can you start putting your stuff up? Yes. All right, so what happens is that when you, for instance, I've just shown you uh, from, from, tract, from the prophets of Zechariah 6 about the passengers and how the bay, which, is, which actually represents the 144,000 are to take the chariot to the promised land. When you show them that, they tell you that these people that they take with them, the 144,000 who take with them to the promised land, actually represent the dead saints, okay? Those are dead saints. This is what they say. So 
those who died under the three angels, you know, message, that's what they, they say. And they say that the idea that there are passengers in the chariot is just a supposition. Otherwise, it doesn't really mean that there are people. But hey, it's a fact, there are people. And uh, we'll read other quotes from the road to show that besides the 144,000, there will definitely be others that will join with them uh, to go and set up the kingdom. And you'll be in, it will be interesting for you to see that it actually takes two sets of leadership to set up a kingdom. The kingdom cannot be set up by the 144,000 or by themselves. We have to have another class of people uh, which makes them two classes and then the kingdom can be set up. So let's go to a uh, timely reading volume one number four and read on page 27. That's the last page on this booklet. Okay, over on page 27, paragraph one. All right, so it's one TG number four, page 27. All right, so the pen of inspiration reads and I quote, says, remember too, that you are candidates for the first fruits to be either, again, it uses the same word, either one with or one of the 144,000, that you are to be without girl in your mouth, Revelation 14, five, end of quote. All right, so here again, we are reminded that we as members of Seventh-day Adventists, we are candidates for the first fruits. And what composes the first fruits? It says you are sealed to be either uh, one with or one of the 144,000. So this statement here sets two positions again. You are either sealed as one of or one with the 144,000. So it's clear there will be those who are to go with the 144,000. And these are living people, okay? How do we know that? We know that because they are sealed. You know, the sealing is for the living when we talk of the seal of Revelation 7. But those who reject this doctrine, they say these are dead ones. They say these are resurrected saints. But then I'll show you that these, of course, are not. And probably you have already seen it from volume two, number five, page eight, where we read our very first quote. It says, those who are found members, the dead are not members of the church, all right? So we have yet another quote that we can read about those that are to go with the 144,000, the living ones. This time, we wanna go to 2TG and number four. We are going to read page 15. All right, page 15, paragraph, I guess, is it one? Yes, paragraph one. Here's, here's the statement. It says, your knowledge of these things, though, will not benefit you if you do not make a desperate effort to be one of or one with the 144,000. Okay, so this is addressing the living people, definitely. You, do, you don't have to, to die to be sealed as one, you know, to be, to be sealed as one, one, or, one, one, one with the 144,000, okay? God is, you know, not telling the, people to desperately make efforts to die so that they could be sealed to be, to go with the 144,000, no. So this has nothing to do with the dead people. It's talking about the living in the church in these latter days. And how do they make that effort? 
by studying and complying with the message, thus we are desperately making efforts to be either one of or one with the 144,000. Okay. So here is another thing they try to do. I want to show you yet another thing they will try to do in their quest to discredit the doctrine of those with. They teach that the special resurrection takes place before the kingdom is set up. Okay? And uh, why do they say so? Because they say the chariot, remember, they teach that the chariot they take to the to the promised land is of the resurrected saints. Okay. But they have to say that because this is what they say by saying the chariot is of the dead resurrected saints. Okay, so to understand, we want to understand the time element of the special resurrection. And to do that, we have to read from the White House recruiter. It will tell us when the resurrection, the special resurrection takes place. So we'll be able to see whether it is prior or during the time of the kingdom. So let's read, let's go to White House recruit and read page 46. All right, so on paragraph one, it says, and I quote, but if you make your decision for the better, then you will receive God's mark. Then it quotes Ezekiel 9, Testament to Ministers, page 445, in your foreheads. But they say, be accounted faultless before his judgment throne and be privileged either to come up in the resurrection of Daniel 12, 2, or, or to stand aforehand with the lamb on Mount Zion, Revelation 14, 1. It continues to say, thence to carry God's message to all nations and bring all your brethren for an offering to the house of the Lord, Isaiah 66, verses 19 and 20. You will become part of the first fruits, the nuclear of the kingdom church, the token of the second fruits of the living of those whom you subsequently bring in. All right, so this is a statement that helps us to understand the time element when the resurrection, the special resurrection will take place. So the word aforehand, you notice, reverses the order of the setting up of the kingdom and of the special resurrection. So it places the kingdom first, then follows the special resurrection. So the kingdom will be set first, then the resurrection will take place in the time of the kingdom. Says the stand on Mount Zion aforehand show, uh, shows that special resurrections takes place after the kingdom is set up, after the 144,000 are already standing on Mount Zion with the lamb. So in other words, the 144,000 uh, stand on Mount Zion ahead of the resurrection. So it's not true that uh, the special resurrection takes place before the, the, the kingdom or before the 144,000 stand on Mount Zion, or, uh, okay? So actually what happens is that the kingdom is set up first by the 144,000 and those that they go with, those in the chariot, the, 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 the passengers, those who are symbolized as passengers in the prophets of Zechariah 6, and then that's when we'll have the resurrection of, special resurrection of Daniel 12, 2. So the key word to understand the time element here is the word aforehand. So aforehand is same as beforehand. 
okay? So the word aforehand there places the kingdom first and then special resurrection afterwards. And that is in harmony with the writings of Sister White in 70, page 17. I think we need to read that one as well and hear what it says in regards to the, to the time when these people who come up who are dead, those who die under the three angels message. So we want to go to 570, uh, that's testament for the church volume seven. And we want to read page 17 and paragraph four says in part, your work, my work will not cease with this life. For a little while, we may rest in the grave, but when the call comes, right? The call would be the resurrection. It says we shall comma in the kingdom of God, take up our work once more. See, it is in the kingdom that they come up when the call is made and then they, they continue with the work. They carry their work that they were doing before they died, those who died under the three angels message. This is what we are, we are taught in this court, okay? So they are resurrected in the time of the kingdom and they are to continue with their work and not before it is set up. It is after they get there that the special resurrection takes place. There is no resurrection other than uh, counterfeits any time before the kingdom is set up. Okay. Special resurrection, the resurrection of the dry bones is to take place during the time of the kingdom. And this is what we, are, we have just read from the writings of Sister White here in 70, page 17. All right, so next I want us to consider the two classes that I alluded to, okay, of people or leaders to set up the kingdom. I did mention that for the kingdom to be set up, it will take two classes of people. So who are these people? Let's understand. And to understand that, we want to go to Answer a book number four. Answer a book number four. We want to read pages 20 and 21. Okay. So there, there is a question about Zion and Jerusalem. Should be question number 85. So, so we are going to read the answer, which will also give us the answer we are looking for as to which people, you know, are to two sets of leadership are to go and set up the kingdom. So it says here near the bottom of the page 20, it says uh, there will be, sorry, it's, it actually says Zion, it's talking about Zion and Jerusalem because the question was about the two. It says Zion and Jerusalem of Isaiah 52, one must represent people for it would, would be ridiculous to say to a hill and to a city, a work, a work put on thy strength, put on thy beautiful garment. All right, so in this paragraph, we are told that Zion and Jerusalem represent people. Okay, it says there's no way somebody could address a mountain or a city to, lead, uh, to wake up or to put on its beautiful garment. They don't put no garments. So these are people being addressed and they are symbolized by these two terms, Zion and Jerusalem. Then the quote continues, says on, Mount, on ancient Zion's exalted hill stood the palace of the king and the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. The rest of the people also cast lots to bring one of them, no, one of the 10, to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine parts to dwell in other cities. Nehemiah, yeah, chapter 11, one. So the royal family resided on Mount Zion 
and the lesser rulers and other government representatives dwelt in Jerusalem proper. All right. So let's read further. It says the core, that core in, in Isaiah 52 1, a work, a work put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beauty of garments, O Jerusalem, is applicable to the Laodicean church. Did you hear that? So Laodicean church is Seventh-day Adventist church. So the call is addressed to the church. Then it says, comma, the last of the seven churches and the one which terminates the period of the wheat and the tares commingled because after she puts on her beautiful garments, the unclean shall no more come into her. Then it says, those who will awake to the arousing core, put on strength by separating from the wicked and put on the beauty of garments by turning to righteousness are those who will in the latter days make up Zion and Jerusalem, the, the princes and the rulers of the people in the kingdom church restored end of court. All right, so here we see that Zion and Jerusalem represent people. And these two people are found in Seventh-day Adventists. And these are the people when they heed the call to our work as a mountain and to put on beautiful uh, garments as a city, Jerusalem, it says then they make up the kingdom. They make up Zion and Jerusalem. Then he calls them princes and rulers. Okay. So we'll have, we'll have to have the Zionists as well as the Jerusalemites to form the kingdom. So the Zionists would be the 144,000 that will stand on Mount Zion. We know that from Revelation 14 with the lamb. But we have to have the lesser rulers that are to dwell in, um, in Jerusalem. And the two classes of people are the ones that are to set up the kingdom. Okay. And um, you can read that from Isaiah. You can read about Zion and Jerusalem in Isaiah 31 verse nine. All right, so yeah, I didn't put it here. So the two classes of people are to a work are actually at work up to that arousing call in Isaiah 52.1. And there, there will be two leadership, okay? Those who stand on Mount Zion and those who dwell in Jerusalem. And not uh, the last statement in the court that we have just read in answer to book number four states that the call to our work is addressed to the church, uh, Seventh-day Adventist, our church. So the two classes of people were, there will actually be two classes of people that will escape the slaughter of Ezekiel 9 in the Seventh-day Adventist church. You see, a kingdom is to be set up by two classes of people. Both of them are living from the church Okay, so before the church is purified, there is no special resurrection. There is no resurrection at all. Before the kingdom is set up, there will be no any resurrection to take place. The resurrection is to take place in the time of the kingdom after the 144,000 are already standing on Mount Zion and those that go with them who dwell in Jerusalem as lesser rulers. Okay, so next, 
uh, I'll tell you uh, how they teach. I'm talking about those that, you know, fight this doctrine, how they teach their doctrine that only the 144,000 will be saved. Uh, Brother Presley is in this chat, is, is on this group, and uh, he will bear me witness. It happened to me and him at a certain year when we had a minister from New York. He came all the way, and then uh, we had a start with him over this matter. So what they do, they take those statements in the road where it states or where it says 144,000 only and say, here we stand. They say that they stand on those statements and they do not normally show the statements about, you know, those with, like the ones that I've showed to you, I've quoted from the Blue Book, volume two, number five, page eight, I've quoted from 1TG number, uh, 1TG number four, page 27, and also 2TG number four, page 15. But we also read from the timer greeting number 222 and track number, you know, two, page 45, where the bay, the 144,000 will take the chariot to the, to the promised land. But you find that there are so many quotations also in the road where the road would not mention those with. It would just say 144,000. And they would list them down and show you that there are actually many in comparison to those which would indicate those with. And they will tell you, here we stand. But by so doing, unwittingly or unknown to them, they are actually teaching 244,000, if you like. They are teaching two groups of the 144,000, meaning why? Because they would not refute, for instance, the quote I gave from the Blue Book, two symbolic code number five, page eight, but they will give you a list of many other quotes where the road simply say the 144,000 only. So if they can't refute that one, and then they present their own quotations from the same road, then it means that uh, they are teaching two. The 144,000 all by themselves, going by the quotations that they present, and the 144,000 and those with them, going by these quotes that I've just shown you. And thus, they are teaching actually 288,000 cents, and which is wrong, okay? That is not right. So we don't do that. The right thing to do would be to harmonize all the quotations on the subject. And uh, this is what every good Bible student would do. And we read about that in answer to book number three, of on page 53, paragraph three. Let's read that one as well. It says, no candid Bible student would build a theory upon an interpretation that would lead him to set aside all other scriptures on the subject. He will seek to make his final analysis in such a way as to be in perfect harmony with all, with all of them or else confess that he does not have the light on the subject. So this is the right thing to do for all Bible students. You put up all the quotations talking about in, in that particular subject and you harmonize them. So I like what they do. When the minister came that year, he called us over where he had lodged and uh, then he asked us to present a study on those with, and I did. And then after doing that, he pulled out his you know, computer and he had listed down quotations that talk about the 144,000 without mentioning those with. So he says, look, these are many and the, 
you only have three or four that talks about those with. So we said, this is not the way we study, okay? How many doctrines, how many verses in the Bible talks about the second coming of our Lord? So it's not a question of how many, okay? But we have to harmonize them. So this is how the discussion ended that we had, but he, had, he requested us to remain with him the whole night. And he said, we could not do that. There was no need for that especially when we saw that he could not refute uh, those statements, which says there will be those with that are to go with the 144,000. So there are several cases in the message where you find similar you know, thing. So I'll give you maybe one or two examples. Uh, let's take the first example. You find that in the road, uh, it, it states that the seventh day, when it talks about the church, at times it will say seventh day Adventist church. And sometimes it simply says church. So when a teacher is giving a study like I'm doing, and if the context is talking about the very church, seventh day Adventist, then I have to mention to you seventh day Adventist. Right, it is important to do that so that someone is not left to guess which church. All right, so we have many instances in the message in the in the road publication where it simply says church. And as a teacher, uh, you have to add Seventh Day Adventist to your to your students, or else you'll be misleading or you leave them you leave root cause for them to guess at what church is being talked of, right? Then we have also other instances. We have um, probably only two or so statements which identifies, for instance, Assyria. Assyria as the Protestant nation. I'm talking about the leopard like beast of Revelation 13, okay? But the rest, you know, it simply says Assyria without mentioning Protestant nations. So as a teacher, again, you have a duty to tell your students by adding the words Protestant nations. They have to know that Assyria refers to the Protestant nations, the English democratic speaking nations of the Western civilization. So you find this, for example, in track number 12, over on page 22, it talks about the Protestant nations, but it simply mentions Assyria. It says Assyria is going to be crushed. It doesn't say Protestant nations. Again, as a teacher, you have to mention, you have to mention it, okay? Now, this, uh, this is same, it's the same applies to the 144,000. We have to add those with every time it says the 144,000, okay? Because the road will not always, does not always say 144,000 and those with. So when you are teaching, you have to bear in mind that there are those with that are to go with the 144,000 and you have to mention it. Why? Because if we do not do that, then we are saying that there is 144,000 all by themselves. There is also another set of 144,000 which has those that are to go with them. And that will be teaching wrong, okay? So this is very important uh, to do when especially we are teaching so that we do not leave anybody you know, uh, lag behind or probably uh, guess at anything. Okay. So you find that there are actually many other arguments, you know, they like to make to try and discredit the doctrine of those with. Uh, but they are all answered, all those arguments, they are answered in, in the article by Brother Don. 
he wrote. <clears throat> After that incident, which took uh, place in New York in, in, in 82, he wrote actually a thick article uh, to respond to all those things, you know, arguments they put up against the doctrine of those that are to go with. And uh, I would request you to actually read that article and uh, you find them being addressed. For now, I'm pretty sure these, you know, references that we have read uh, together here makes the subject sufficiently clear that there will be others, uh, you know, living that are to go with the 144,000. And uh, they, of course, fall under the first fruits harvest. Sometimes you wonder to say, then how do, how do we classify them? They actually fall under the first fruit harvest, but they are not part of the 144,000. They actually go with the 144,000. And those with can either be Jews or be Gentiles. It doesn't matter. It's God that will seal people and uh, he'll seal some to be one of some to be one with the 144,000. Let's read the statement in answer book number four, page 35. Okay. Paragraph one says, uh, in the first analysis, however, it is neither the road's purpose nor its intent to say just how many wise and how many foolish uh, there will be in this first fruit harvest. For when the whole truth is made known, the figure of the five wise virgins, besides comprehending the 144,000 from the tribes of Israel, may be found to be including a considerable number from the Gentile nation. Okay. So you see that besides the 144,000, there will be, you know, these are strictly uh, from the 12 tribes of Israel, but there will be others. There will be others. And this is talking about the 10 virgins so which means it's talking about the church. So apart from the 144,000 number, there will be others who may even be Gentiles that will be sealed and will go with the 144,000 and will be part, uh, will, will actually fall under the first fruit harvest. We can also read from the Blue Book, uh, we go to 11 symbol, symbolic code number seven about those which are not of the house of Israel. 11 symbolic code number seven and uh, page 23, right on the top paragraph zero, it says it may be that there will be many from Assyria and Egypt that will join the 144,000 and go to worship the road in the holy mount at Jerusalem. See? It mentions Jerusalem. These do not stand on Mount Zion. So apart from those from the church, we have others from the world, Assyria, from among the Protestant nations. This is one example I mentioned. It just says Assyria. Assyria is the Protestant nations. Egypt would be the world. So there will be other people during the transition period when Assyria is falling, the kingdom is being set up, and then Babylon is being also organized to, 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 to come on the stage of action. Then there will be other people that will hear us when we are preaching, and then they are going to join the 144,000 to go and worship the Lord in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. He says, since Isaiah says they were ready to perish, it may happen just at the making up of the image of the beast. You see, Assyria is falling, the leopard-like beast, then 
the scarlet colored beast, the image of the beast is being formed. It says comma, or just in the time of transition, when the world emerges from the Assyrian period and enters the period when Babylon the Great rules. Okay, so we will have others. These are Gentiles, these are from other churches, Protestant churches, some may join. This is before the time of the loud cry, the, the, the second harvest. It is, it is still in the time of the first fruit harvest. And we have, besides those that have already pointed out from the church, there will be those Gentiles from Assyria, the Protestant nations, from Egypt to the world, and they join and they worship God at Mount Jerusalem. That's what we have just read here in the blue book. So we have also people from the world that are to join apart from the, the 144,000. Remember the 144,000, these are actually of the 12 tribes of Israel. And we read about that in tract number eight, page eight. Let's read that uh, statement. Track number eight, over on page eight, paragraph one, where it talks about the 144,000. It says, consequently, the 144,000 being of the sons of Jacob cannot be of the Gentile nation. See? They, therefore, first of all, are renewed, though not necessarily of the present identifiable Jews, Jewish stock. So being renewed descendants of Jacob means that they have the blood of uh, Jacob, all right? So God has, you know, a, a, a genealogical record. He knows who has the blood, who has not. So when it comes to the sitting of the 144,000, one should have the blood of Jacob. He must be a renewed descendant of Jacob. And then the rest can be of the Gentile nations. And this is what we have just read in, in the blue book, those that come from Assyria, come from Egypt, and so on. All right, so this is how it will be. So let's talk about briefly, uh, maybe before we talk about anything, let's see if we have any questions. Okay, mm -hmm. so we have, it's, we have more than just the 144,000, according to this court, they're coming from the church. Okay. I think uh, a lot of people have an issue with, mm -hmm. uh, and what I heard from the conversation on the chat mm -hmm. is, you know, when people, they feel like it's too strong language um, when we call another association a false association. So like oh, a lot of people it, feel offended by that. Can you go into that? You did have some quotes so that we didn't go through about that. Sure, we can, we can talk about that, Sister Judy. Uh, uh, I mean, Sister Ho, sorry. Uh, I'm glad you have brought that issue, Sister Ho. Um, I'll talk of one particular brother here in Zambia. The only thing he despised about us is the, he says the language is too strong, like what you're saying, okay? And they don't like the idea, like you have said, of calling other associations false. All right, so let's read the quote about that. All right, let's read uh, Sanctified Life, page 65. Okay. Um, the pen of inspiration, paragraph one, reads, and I quote, 
talking about the apostles, he says, but the apostle teaches that while we should manifest Christian cares, we are authorized to call sin and sinners by their right names, that this is consistent with true charity. While we are to love the souls for whom Christ died and labor for those, I mean, for their salvation, we should not make a compromise with sin. We are not to unite with the rebellious and call this charity. God requires his people in this age of the world to stand as did John in his time, unfringingly for the right in opposition to so destroying errors. All right, so the point I'm making here is that we are authorized to call sin by its right name. And all these associations, I want to tell you, brethren, you have to come to terms, are false. All right? They are false association. The message talks about them. They were all started by usurpers, those who would want to take the position um, of Elijah, active usurpers. They are mentioned in Time of Greeting, Volume 1, number 14 on page 22. So let's talk about what happens to them, okay? We, there will come a time when people appreciate that we are, we were very, in fact, they will, they will accuse us not of not being a too honest, not being so loving to them and that we watch them going the wrong way. So inspiration from the quote that we have just read authorizes us to call them what they are. These are rebels. There's only one true association. Uh, I think I'll add on some things. I'll go further in that regard so that uh, this matter can be cleared. First of all, before we talk about what happens to these false associations, we must understand that God condemns spirits. Rebellion is condemned. That's the first sin in heaven. Lucifer rebelled against the authority of God. Everybody, anybody else that rebels against the organized structure of God are rebels and they share in the spirit of the devil and it must be condemned. Over in, uh, in, in TM, TM Testament for the Church, volume 61, paragraph two, God has a church upon the earth who are his chosen people, who keep his commandments. He is leading not astray offshoots. He refers to God is not leading these offshoots, not one here and one there, but a people. See, God has a, an organization to start with. You must understand that we have the invisible chariot. That's the, 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 the headquarters. So then we have the visible one. How can we have one invisible chariot and have 20 literal headquarters here and there? That's confusion. They are all started by the devil and his agents. The court continues to say, the truth is a sanctifying power, but the church militant is not the church triumph, triumphant. There are tears among the wheat. Would thou then that we gather them up? Was the questioner of the servant. But the master said, rather answered, nay, lest while you gather up the tears, ye root up also the wheat with them. The gospel net draws not only good fish, but bad, bad ones as well. And the Lord only knows who are his. So we have all these bad elements, false associations. There is only one true one and God knows his own. Okay. So what will happen to these false associations? 
uh, you have to understand that these false associations are not of God and they will be overthrown by their own errors. And that's what we read from 1T, page 414. I want us to read it together. Testimonies, rather, I mean, testimonies for the church, volume one, over on page 414. It reads, according to the light which God has given me, there will yet be a large company raised up in the East to consistently obey the truth. Those who follow in the distracted course they have chosen will be left to embrace errors, which will finally cause their overthrow. But they will, for a time, be stumbling blocks to those who would receive the truth. End of quote. Now, there's something we need to understand. There is, there is a right course to take. But we, we have these other associations that are taking the distracted course from the right one. So what will happen to them? We are told that they will eventually be overthrown by their own errors. So there are a number of them. And whichever association you choose, you embrace error, which will eventually cause their overthrow. All these associations are nothing but stumbling blocks to true Davidians. We have a number of us coming from these associations. Of course, we are just stumbling for a while, but eventually we get to know the truth and leave them and follow the right course and join the true association of God. Brother Obi, uh, sorry to interrupt, but could you, I think it's important to pull up the quote about usurpers. Could you give that to me again? Okay, that was, it's volume one time grading number 14 Jesus. on page 22, right on the top of the page. Let's read from where it says, all these taking place. Or if okay. you like, we want to start with, yes. Okay, let's read it. Um, All these taking a, place at this particular time and the prophecies now unfolded prove that anti-typical Zerubbabel must now be here and that he, as he has started the work, he also must finish it. The fact that inspiration takes the pains to tell who is to finish the work in itself is proof that there must be active usurpers of his office as there were of Moses's office. Yeah. Yeah, that's a terrible exactly. thing. Exactly. So you, you yeah. this is what we read in Zechariah 4 verse 9, uh, rather this eight and nine, it talks about who is to finish the work. It says the Rubabel laid the foundation of this house and his hands will finish the work. Then here we are taught that the fact that, the, the fact that inspiration takes the pain to tell us who is to finish the work in itself is proof that there, are, there must be active usurpers of his office as they were of Moses' office. So Elijah has challenges, has these usurpers who want to take his position as Moses had those. You remember Korah, Dathan and Abiram? Today we have untypical Dathans, Abirams and Korah who have come up with all these association so you allow me to talk about them a bit and then you see how serious this whole matter is. I'm going to carry on a bit, all right? This was not really part of the study, but I'll be asking you to be posting certain quotes from time to time so we can read and together. Okay. Sure. 
So before we go to that, first of all, let me talk about the importance of uh, East, okay? Or maybe before we talk about, yeah, East is very important in regard to the closing work for the church. Very important. So here we are told that, let's go to, if you go to track number one, okay? We find that Ezekiel, he actually saw the Lord visiting the earth, all right? And um, upon visiting the earth, he went to the threshold of the house. That would be the church, Seventh-day Adventist church. Okay. And there he appointed a typical Ezekiel to bear the message to the church. And he also called those who had charge over the church, the city, to draw near. And he called forth the man that had the writer's ink on by his side to set a mark on the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that are done in the church. Now, we already, I have already alluded it. When we say the church, this church we are talking about, at the fulfillment of this prophecy, when the Lord visits the earth on his chariot, it's the seventh day Adventist church. And that's what we are told in track number nine, not track number nine, sorry, but uh, testimony for the church volume nine on page 164. The pain of inspiration caused Seventh day Adventist as modern Israel. Well. So it is to this church that he comes and teach, okay? Bear the message to them. So I want us to move together. Let's move to, uh, we come to chapter nine and read verse, verse three, Sister Hall. Okay, and the glory of the, the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. You want me to continue? Yes. And the Lord said unto him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others, he said, in mine hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men, which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain, go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. And it came to pass, as while they were slaying them, and I was left, that I fell upon my face and cried and said, Ah, Lord God. Wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel and thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Then he said unto me, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great and the land is full of blood and the city full of perverseness. For they say, the Lord hath forsaken the earth and the Lord seeth not. And as for me also, mine eyes shall not spare neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. And behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. Thank you so much, uh, Sister Ho. Right, so you notice that the Lord, when he visited the earth, that was in 1929, 
upon verse 3, you read and it says, and the glory of the God of Israel was upon, was gone up from the cherubim, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. So, all right, the glory, I'm on verse 3, it says, the glory of God of Israel was gone up from the cherubim, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. So upon a live on earth, that was in 1929, God visited the earth invisibly and he went into the church. That's the threshold of the house, according to track number one, page 21, okay? And you have read how he has commanded the man with the writer's ink on by his side to go and mark those that, have, that are sighing and crying for all the abominations that be done in the church. And later, he commanded those who, had bearing, who were bearing sort of weapons to slay. Now, I'm interested in verse 11. Verse 11 says, and behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the ink horn by his side, reported the matter saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. So you see, after the sealing, he went to the Lord on his chariot, the invisible chariot, which is the, the headquarters and reported the matter that he had done as he was commanded, meaning he had marked all those who were sighing and crying in the church. So next I want us to move to the preceding, I mean the following chapter 10 and read verses 18, Probably let's read just two, yeah. Let's read 18 and 19. All right, if we have our Bibles, I got my Bible open, so I'll read and you can read yours as well. Wallace, Sister Ho is going to post them on the screen. Ezekiel 10 verse 18. Then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. I want you to compare this verse, Ezekiel 10, 18, with Ezekiel 9, verse 3. If you look at Ezekiel 9, verse 3, you see the Lord disembarking from his vehicle and went into the church and commanded the man with the ink horn to mark the people. And then in verse 11, the marking was done and the city uh, um, and the slaughter was done and he reported the matter to the Lord in verse 11 of chapter nine. Now in chapter 10, verse 18, we see the glory of the Lord departing from off the threshold of the house, meaning he's now leaving the church and he stood over the cherubim, he stood by his vehicle. Now verse 19, and the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight, that is in Ezekiel's sight. When they went out, the, the wheels also were besides them and everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house and the glory of the Lord of Israel was over them above. See, after this, the, the sealing, the marking is done, the report is made, and then the Lord leaves the church and he mounts back to heaven. And all those who escaped the slaughter, who are they? The 144,000 and those with them, they are left at the east gate of the Lord's house. Now, I'm showing you the importance of the East in regard to the closing work for the church. The headquarters of the sitting message at the time of the sitting of the 144,000 is to be found in the East side of America. And that would be at the East gate. You want to look at chart, what chart is that? Chart number 18 about Ezekiel. Sister Ho, if you can show us that chart. So you see the diagram on your left. And if you go to 
Tuesara, page 298. Sarah, page 298, we read, we are told that the diagram on this chart represents the SDA church. All right? Oh, it was at 298. 298. I'm trying to get there. Okay. Two, nine, eight. It won't let me go. Uh, it won't let me go to two, 298 for some reason. You want to go to page? Uh, let's see. I don't know if it's in this search engine. Hold on. I know some, yeah, it's not there in this search engine. Some some associations leave that page out. Let me go to the internet. And see, that's another reason why I don't know who made that search engine, but they left out that entire section. Um, I know they do. So that's why it's a, it's right. it's important to understand that um, you know these associations are omitting um, things that are written in the rod. All right, so I'm in two SR page two ninety eight paragraph zero, meaning right on the top of the page, and it's talking about the diagram on the on that chart of the, I mean, of the mighty River of Ezekiel 47, it says, and I quote, the diagram on the chart, page 294. So if you go to the Shepherd Road book, you find it on page 294, the same chart, comma, represents the SDA church in Gede as it becomes the house of David. And the place of the river in Egram denotes the world. Then it says the stream from the fountain where it first starts to the east gate represents the 144,000. The river stands for the great multitude, end of quote. Now, you know what? The diagram on that chart, when you're looking at chart number 18, that diagram on your left represents the SDA church as it becomes the house of David, meaning during the time of the sitting of the 144,000 and those that are to go with them, those will form the house of David. Then it goes further to say the stream, there is a stream if you, wanna, if you take us back to the chart, within the diagram, starting from the outer to the east gate, it says it represents the 144,000. So now, when you are looking at that chart and you are looking at the diagram, you are looking at SDA church. But when you go to page 97, <clears throat> to a Sarah page 97, let me also read a statement here. Right on the top of it, it says, the direction of this compass denotes that the message of the loud cry is to start eastward when it is first reviewed. Then it says the church membership being largely east of California and across the Antarctic, naturally the message must start toward the east. The, the symbolic prophecy reveals that the message of the loud cry is to originate in California. All right, so what are we talking about here? You, you are looking at chart number 18, there you see the diagram representing SDA church. Then we are told that the message originated in California, that's west side of America. Then we are told that when it is first reviewed, it takes an eastward course. 
And over on page 298, we are told that the stream from the outer to the east gate represents the 144,000. But the river beyond the diagram represents the great multitude. So we had the message originating in California in 1929, 1930, the first headquarters was set up there in California, the west side of America. Then if you go to the blue book, you go to volume one, number 10, page three, you read about the headquarters, another headquarters, of 1935, which was set up in Waco, in Waco, Texas. And we are told that the people were guided by the stream from California, they went to Waco, Texas, because that's where the stream read them. And if you look at the chart, it is going across the SDA church in America, because all these states, California, is in America, Waco, Texas is in America. Then it must go eastward. East, when they go to the east, that's the time when the 144,000 are sealed. And I've just read to you Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 19, that after the sealing is done, the report has been given, the Lord is out of the church and is going back to heaven. Those that escape the slaughter are left start standing at East Gate. That would be the headquarters in the east side of America. That's South Carolina. We are living right in the time of the sitting of the 144,000. The first headquarters in California was set up in 1930. There was no sitting of the 144,000. Later, five years later, in 1935, the headquarters moved, taking an eastward course from the west side of America to the east across the Americas to Waco, Texas. There was no sitting of the 144,000 until it was liquidated and shut down around 1961. After the knockout blow, then 19, 61, the reorganization came later in 1970, the headquarters moved to the east side. So you find the east here, I've read the east in the Bible, I've, raised, I've read the east gate here in the Shepherd's Road message on page 298. And that's where the saints will be sealed from. Now, how, what about these others who are not in the east? That's the question. That has been the question and people have a problem with that. All right, so we are going to talk about them briefly. Let me, let's read a bit. We, we can mention about them. The, the 144,000 and those with them, they are sealed when the headquarters of the message is in the right in the east, at the east gate of the Lord's house. Okay, just before it goes in the time of the river, which represents the great multitude. It's important to note that the prophet is the one that said that that stream actually represents lo locations and the direction. I think he read that quote, but I wasn't able to pull it up, but that's also in our some symbolic code, the latest one, um, Ezekiel's River. So the prophet himself, you know, said that, hey, this, this, this stream is seen to have an eastward course, and it's going to go across to Waco, and then he, he wanted to liquidate Waco as well, you know, because he probably knew that the city would come up around it. And then we have the testimony of the brethren in Salem in 1970 um, and before that, who, who went down there and joined with the Salem Rest Home, which was part of uh, the Waco um, movement. And 
they told they were expecting them they said you know we knew you guys were going to come because the prophet told us that one day the work would all be down here so that's when it moved to the salem um south carolina area all right so let's talk about these other associations where are they according to one t on page 414, which we read, says they have taken distracted course, right? The right course would be the east. That's where the stream goes from the west to the east gate. And right at the east gate, you have the ceiling of the 144 Southern and they are left there when the road mounts up back to heaven. Now, we have the branch Davidians Branch Davidians, they reject some truth. All these associations, we are told they distracted by embracing errors. So it means they rejected part of the truth. And before we go any further, I'm going to mention some of them, especially the major one and the truth that they have rejected before we close our study. But let's read about the rejection of the truth first of all. Let's go to 1SR, page 160, and read about rejection of truth. 1SR, 160. Sister Ho, I don't know if you can get us there. All right, let me read it. It's paragraph number two. It says, and I quote in part, we conceive that there are none upon whom God's wrath will be visited more completely than upon those who have known the truth, are closely related to it as it were, and yet turn from it to become persecutors of those who do right. Then it says, even as it is a blessed thing to accept the truth, so it is a fierce thing to reject it. Then talking of rejection, it says, and rejection need not include all truth. To reject a part may be just as fatal as to reject the whole. So be, so all should be well, end of quote. So this is what constitutes rejection of truth. All these associations have rejected the truth. By rejecting part of it, it's as good as rejecting the whole entire message. So now let's consider uh, what they have rejected. All right. Uh, you find that I was just talking about the Bashan Davidians. You find that the Bashan, uh, before we, uh, I, I talked of the branch Davidians, the branch teaches the observance of feast laws. Okay. That's what they teach. Now that is an error. To observe the feast laws is tantamount to the rejection of Jesus Christ our Lord. And it is condemned in 2 TG number 37, page 15. Sister Ho, 2 TG number 37. All right. It reads. All right, it says, but since we are living in the Christian era, if we should now observe the typical sacrifice law and system, we should thereby demonstrate and believe in Christ who has come. You hear that? Now that we are living in this Christian dispensation, by observing the typical sacrificial or the feast laws, we thus reject or demonstrate an unbelief in Christ. We thus reject him. Those were observed in the Old Testament in the type. Okay? Then it says, paragraph number one, and so as this law was nailed to the cross, Colossians 2.14, we need not and must not observe it now. 
you see? So this is the era that the branch Davidians have embraced and they will be overthrown by it. They have rejected the truth because rejecting include not the whole, rejecting a part is as fatal as rejecting the whole. That's what it says. Then we can move to another association. We have the Bashan ones. Okay, the Bashan teaches that Camel is the little headquarters. Okay, you read about the spiritual pastors in Micah 7 14. There are three of them. Okay, Camel, Bashan, and Griad. But they teach that Camel is a little headquarters which was set up in 1935 in Waco, Texas. And they teach that Camel has withered. So now, if you go to 1SR, page 243, you find that Camel is a spiritual pastor and not a little headquarter. And if you go to the Blue Book, even you and me knows that Camel has not yet withered. So this is the truth that they have rejected. Let's read about uh, Camel being the spiritual pastor as opposed to what they teach. You want to go to 1 Sarah, page 243. It says, it's commenting on Micah 7, 14. It says, feed thy people with thy rod. The verb feed is to be understood as spiritual food. And that food is truth and is found in the road. Therefore, we again have the command to give out the book, that is to feed God's people. Then it says, Camel, Bashan, and Gilead are used as symbols of good spiritual pastor. Okay, end of quote. So, but they ignore this. And what do they do, like Sister Ho was saying? They actually condemn the whole entire Shepherd's Road book, volume one and two. They have no regard for this. If you find them with this book, at times they leave out the page. Very sad. So again, they have rejected the truth. They have embraced the error that Camel is a physical place when it is a spiritual pasture. So they have taken a distracted course and eventually these errors will cause them to get to be overthrown. Okay, let's move to the next one. There are those who are the, the Gilead Davidians, they're in Canada. I hardly hear people talking about them. The headquarter of the sealing message is supposed to be in America. I've already shown you, we read that it has to be in America, originating in the West California, moved to the middle, that's Waco, and eventually to the East, and then you have the sitting of the 144,000. That's America. Then from there, it goes to the river time. That will be the great multitude. But Canada, no, no, you cannot have, God will not have his headquarters outside America. And we read that from track number eight, page 24. Let's read that one. And we'll see the, the error that they have embraced. And the truth that they have rejected. They have also rejected the truth about going to the East. All right, so here it says, it reads and uh, trying to quote where it says, although the marking and the slaughter of Ezekiel 9 includes the church, Judah and Israel, the hurting by the winds and the hurting by the angels, Revelation 7 includes all the world, both the earth and the sea, each of which is inclusive of a different, a different locality. The sea is the realm of nature. In the realm of nature, the storehouse or home of waters. 
Okay, then it says, is therefore in the realm of symbols, the birthplace of the nations, the old country, the, the old country, comma. Then it says the earth, the opposite of the sea is correspondingly a domain away from the old country. It is located to John in the symbol of the two horned beasts coming up, not out of the sea, but out of the earth. Revelation 13, 11. The only place where trees naturally grow. And as according to Daniel 20, verse, I mean, Daniel 4, verse 20 to 22, trees are figurative of rulers. Therefore, the trees in this instance represent the ancient men before the house, a fact which reveals that this period, rather in this period, the church's headquarters are in the two horn domains, I mean, two horns beast domain, dash the new earth, the new world, the earth. Now, the two horned beast of Revelation 13, 11, according to Great Controversy, page 440, is America. You can also read from track number 12 over on page 23. It's America. So the headquarters is to be in America. And this is the truth that those Gideon, you know, Davidians have rejected. Okay. In addition, they have also rejected the truth about the east, the, the eastward coast. All right, let's move to the next one. We come to the Weko Davidians. Weko are the ones we have dealt with. They reject the truth about those with that are to go with the 144,000. And I've already shown you the proof. Two symbolic code number five, page eight, paragraph one a very clear statement that cannot be refuted. All who are found members of the church up to the fulfillment of Ezekiel 9 will either be sealed as one of or one with, or else they will be left to die under the slaughter weapons by the men in Ezekiel 9. They reject the truth about those with they reject the East. They know about it. They all know about all these truths. So that's about the Waco brethren. I mean, the Waco and those in New York. It started with the brethren in New York. Then they had the spirit of those who went to Waco. And now there are several headquarters at Waco, maybe two or three. The last time I checked. So all these associations have rejected part of the truth and they have embraced errors and they are going to be overthrown by those errors. All right, let's see if anybody has anything to say. Sister Ho. Uh, yeah, I did have something to say. I wanted to just bring up um, a, an important quote uh, that we had in our symbolic code about what the Reformation is. We all have heard that term, revival and reformation, revival and reformation. But the prophet... Um, actually it gives it a, a distinct definition. Can you speak a little bit to that? I'm trying to find the, oh, here it is. Okay. That's page, you're on which book? Is this the Leviticus? Yes, and the Leviticus of the DSDA, uh, which is our constitution, yes. the prophet uh, explains what the Reformation actually is. And remember, 
This message restores every divine institution, including headquarters. So we are glad, it says, as restorers of every divine institution, we are glad to announce the re to the readers of present truth that besides the literature of revival, they may now also obtain that of reformation, our organizational publication, the Leviticus of the, Divi of the Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. End of quote. And that's in Leviticus. I know, did I put the page number? I think I left out the page number. Answer a book number one, page 36 or 37 there about. Okay, thank you. And so the literature is the revival. That's the actual message that we read and that word of God gets in our word. That's the inspired interpretation of the word of God. That, that word of God through the inspired interpretation of the prophets gets into our, our being and changes us as, as we digest it and ask for forgiveness of sins as we become aware of the abominations in the, in, that are done in the church, okay? But the key to the Reformation is in how we are to actually run headquarters, how we're supposed to run ourselves as an organization, because the kingdom is not an abstract thing. It's a very tangible thing. And Brother Hodder says it's a place that is going to need to be managed by God's people. So we already have to be in trained during the sealing time, training ourselves to run the organization according to all that the rod entails and according to the Leviticus. And so if associations were established by someone breaking off or splitting off and it was unjustified by the Leviticus, well, that means that they were in rebellion. It's not about Politics is simply about God is the God of order. And so everything that they did was governed by a system and was governed by laws and that God gave them. And so we have been given that constitution and that is our Leviticus and that is what we are to go by. And that's how we're supposed to run it. So that that adherence to the Leviticus is the reformation that we can, that was conducted through ourselves. And if someone is rebellious to that, well, then they're not completely receiving both the revival or, and the reformation, because they're basically saying, I'm just going to do what I want to do. And this was something that personally was very hard for me for a long time to understand. I didn't understand, you know, all the fighting that went on amongst Davidians because I myself didn't understand the the tr the full truth on and the history, um, so it can be difficult. But those quotes about the usurpers, I encourage everyone to do a search through the complete rod on usurpers, office seekers. Um, read your symbolic codes that the prophet wrote, because he is dealing with active usurpers and problems, not within Laodicea, but within the organization. He is, he is correcting people all throughout those symbolic codes. He's offering reproofs. He's telling people that they need to follow directions, you know, that they have people writing in always complaining. <laughs> you know, he's dealing with the management of, you know, the, God's people, <laughs> Davidians. In, in those documents. So this, this is why we teach this as headquarters because no, no one man is to split off and say, hey, I have an idea and I'm going to start a new doctrine and we're going to call us the Davidians. That is confusion. Yes, uh, that was very important quote that you brought forth, Sister Ho. It's from Answer Book 1 on page 38 on the bottom of the page, which says... This, our message can be divided into two parts, okay? Says as restorers of every divine institution, that's what we are. 
we are glad to announce to the readers of Present Truth that besides the literature of revival, they may now also obtain that of reformation, then comma, our organizational publication, the Leviticus of the, of the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist. So you see that the road message is divided into two parts. We have the revival part, we have also the reformation part. So the reformation part is the Leviticus, huh? the Leviticus of the Vedian Adventist Church, that booklet, our constitution. That's the one that gives us the structure and guides us how to run the institution this association. The rest of the road publication would constitute the revival part. So when you read uh, the, 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 the constitution, you are guided on how to run and how we are structured. Everything we do is given to us. So that's the reformation part of the message. Whereas the rest of the literature, when you study it and read it, then you get revived. Therefore, you would have heed to the core of revival and reformation. So it is very important for us to do that, to, to take both, to embrace both the revival and reformation part of the message. So we, we, we have just talked about all these associations and I've also tried to show you which part of the truth they, they reject and the, some of the errors they teach. Okay, I, I talked to, I think I was talking about those in New York are teaching against Ezekiel's river. Okay, they reject the truth about those with the doctrine that we have just discussed. So they are wrong. Okay, same with those in Waco, they are <clears> all going to be overthrown by their own errors. But there is something very important that we need to understand. I want to call your attention again. You see, you have a very good concern about these other people with these false associations. By the way, you must understand what you find in these associations uh, are usurpers, and their idol worshippers. But besides these people, I did quote from uh, one T testament for the church, volume one, page 414. It talks about people who are being distracted. Okay? Let's reread it. I have it before uh, me right here. It says, according to the light which God has given me, so according to the light that God gave to Sister White, by the way, if you go to this same book, but you go to page 147, Sister White will tell you that she was impressed about two directions in America, the East and the West, all right? Around that time when she wrote it, there was a problem with the east side of America. So she commanded people, the saints, to leave the east side of America, to go to the west side of America, to wait for the loud cry message, which is the shepherd's road message. So she talks about all that. And now when you come to the back of this book, we are come to the near, near the back of this book here on page 414, she says, there will yet be Okay, despite the problem that was in the East when the message was to start to come. You remember the sitting angel is to ascend from the East. The message was to start from the East, but for some reason, people were not read. So the message, the angel has to ascend to the West. And that's why we read in 2SR page 297 that the message originated in the West in California. But immediately after it originated, it takes an eastward course, meaning it has to be in the east. That's why there is no ceiling 
in the West, you no know, sitting in the middle of America, the sitting is gonna take place in the East side of America. I read Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 19, that by the time the sitting is done and the Lord leaves the church and goes back to heaven, those that escape the slaughter, those, the 144,000 and those with them are left at the East Gate, which is the East side of America. It says the East Gate of the Lord's house. So the point I'm making, let's continue reading here in 1 T4 14. It says, there will yet be a large company raised up in the East, regardless of what happened, Time is coming when a large company is to be raised in the east. What kind of a company is this? It says to consistently obey the truth. These are very particular with the truth. It says those who follow in the distracted course they have chosen will be left to embrace errors. I've, we've just talked about all these who have taken distracted courses says, which will finally cause their overthrow. Then a comma, it says, but they will for a time be stumbling blocks to those who would receive truth. What does this imply? There are many men of the brethren that are to constitute the first harvest fruits to be either one of or one with, in these false associations. They are being blocked by the usurpers but they'll only be stumbling for a while. The time is coming, I can assure you, that these people will see the light and will leave this false association and join the true association in the East. So we need to reach out to these people. We have no problem with them. These are our brothers. Look, where are we coming from? We're coming from these same false associations ourselves. All right, so they will certainly join us. And I know before the fulfillment of the slot of Ezekiel 9, God has a way of doing his own things, okay? Something will happen that will wake the people up and God will glorify his association and the rest of his people sit that are in this false association and they'll break off from them and join the truth. So this is what I can say to your question. We have true people of God that are being broke by these usurpers, but it's a matter of time as they continue, if they are truth seekers, eventually they'll see the light and they will join, they, they will get affiliated to the true headquarters of God in the East side of America. Amen. And you don't know, like, Pe people um, try to make the differences from the association about this or that, this person's doing this, or they hear this rumor. And it, when you really get down to, to, to the tooth and nail of it, it is, these are doctrinal issues. So that means that it's our duty as Davidians to search the written word that we have and find out what is true um, through the rod. And so, uh, you know, personality differences, oh, you don't agree with the strategy of this person or that person or the administration. If you're unsatisfied with an association because of something like that, you know, you may not be swayed, but if you're but if you're seeing uh, inconsistencies in um, following the rod, that, that's where our strength is in Salem. And I believe it's already happening. People are already starting to wake up and, um, and seek truth uh, that we teach because we have stuck to the rod. And we're one of the original associations. And a lot of them have come from subsequent movements um, from from that small group who reorganized in Riverside, California after the knockout blow and then realized they should really be in the East from what you know the uh, Shepherd's Rod <clears throat> books say. Um, and that's why 
we have some associations that either don't print a part of those volumes or they leave out pages. We've had testimony from former believers in Bashan that they ripped out pages um, and they had to order from us to get the full books and uh, all sorts of, you know, uh, uh, deceptive, devious things that shouldn't be happening from the people of God. So that's why we put out the studies about usurpers and some people can see them as very harsh or, or, you know, like we want to have conflict with people, but it's not. It's just that because we don't have like the structure that the Adventist church has, people look at the Davidian message as an opportunity. They see it to promote self and God will have none of that. That's why the things happened that happened with the Branch Davidians, because they laid their hand on something that was sacred and tried to mix it with the common. So Brother Adair always taught that there will be a showdown, you know, between, um, you know, or someone is to typify or typified by Laban is going to come after the people of God as they're, uh, you know, who, who are typified as um Jacob on their on their way back home and you know my thoughts were always okay it's the false association <laughs> wanting to you know hold on to um you know their members as they finally realize where they're supposed to be it's going to be clear trust me it's going to be clear where God's truth is you know by the time the ceiling is coming and we're, we're going to become more and more unified, more and more people are going to come in, and it's going to be clear who has who has been holding the torch of truth and where God's invisible throne is. That throne of God, Brother Hada said, is an invisible base of operations and is standing at the threshold of the house mm -hmm. where the headquarters is. Mm -hmm. That's where God's invisible base of our operations is. So these are very important and deep Amen. truths that we need to understand. And I didn't understand it until I came to Salem. That's when I began to understand. You're right. right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Amen. And, uh, Amen. There's an I just want to say, um, um, I want to thank each of you for for allowing the Holy Spirit to guide you and use you in, in delivering this message because I feel thankful and this this message fills my heart because um I do feel that this is the truth. And I when I listened to Brother Obi's um lesson on the Ezekiel River and the East Gate on the website. And then hear it, hearing him today, it really, really helps things become crystal clear, clearer for me. Amen. And I just want to be, I want to you all, and I want to know what I can do and we can do individually more to assist in building up the the property and the, and the, the East Gate and Amen. preparing and preparing for the while we're here. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, I think um, we we will have another meeting right, with the so members. We will uh, to address. We want to launch. You know, our we want to reignite. Let's not say launch because it's already been launched, but the hunting campaign here in the U.S. And that's why mm -hmm. we've been trying to make so many resources and materials for anyone, you know, who is a lay member to just go ahead and start reaching out to those Adventists that they know, those Davidians that they know, you know, and ask and, and pray to receive the Holy Spirit to, to work in wisdom, to work in harmony with the Holy Spirit to share, you know, these truths. 
And that's what our, that's what our message is. I mean, that's what our duty is. We have to sigh and we have to cry. The sighing is the sharing part. And, and we just have to let the Lord lead. Each of, each of us has a duty to do this. So I've been making resources. I'm about to come out with a video about the kingdom, part one and part two. It is geared towards Laodiceans, but it's still very good for, um, you know, review for Davidians. And um, these are uh, tools and, and things that we haven't had before. It, um, in the association so we can send people something they can watch and, and, and it's modern and it's, uh, you know, more in keeping with modern technology because um, it's really hard to get people's attention nowadays because of the nature of technology. So we have to try to compete with that. So we have the kingdom video that should be done this week. We'll be sending that out and we'll put this Bible study out for those that are trying to reach out to Davidians. And so we're trying to create those things so that every person can do their part. And that's basically how everyone can contribute. Now, as far as headquarters, right now we do have a place prepared and we do need to rebuild other parts, but we that's a major plan of action where we basically could discuss later at a later meeting. Um, when it's not the Sabbath. So we'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Sister Judy and Brother brother Obi go ahead and um, close up, I guess, or finish answering questions. Okay, are there any more questions um, or comments? First of all, thank you so much, Brother Obi, for that in-depth study. I guess the spirit led, led us to go there, you know, because your study was um, originally based on another topic. And we didn't, uh, sorry, we didn't have the slides to this. I wish we'd have had some slides to this, the latter part of the study um, to make it more clear about the associations. But, you know, it's how the spirit led uh, Brother Obi and uh, uh, we just thank the Holy Spirit for being here. We uh, thank all of you for taking the time out to join and sitting through this long study. So, um, you know, I see a hand up. Brother Obi, I'll leave it with you with uh, what you have to say. Yes. I just have one question. What is the Gilead group? What are they leaving out? In, in Canada. Oh, yes. Sorry, I muted myself. Oh. I heard the question by Sister yes. uh, regarding uh, Gilead Davidians. Yes. Uh, you find that those Davidians are in Canada. Right. When the Lord pays the headquarters during the sitting time is to be in America. Exactly. That's according to track number eight on page 24. Remember yes. that quote? Uh, yes, I yes, have. Yes, the headquarters mm -hmm. during the schooling time is to be found with whom the two homes lamp like domain, which is America. Okay. I thought okay. I had missed something so else. That's on the that. truth. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I think we have to, yeah. Thank you so much, my sister. If nobody else has a question. Right. Oh, I just want to add to that, um, Brother Obi. I just want to add to Sister Millie. Um, also, the Gilead um, Jordan, um, he came from Bashan, Brother uh, MJ Bingham. He broke yes. away from them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, one question Where is Bashan located? Where are they? In, are they in Waco? No, in, Exeter, Missouri. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it's Missouri, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, they're in a literal place called Bashan. You know, Bashan, that's the name of the Bation, city Missouri. or whatever. They're in Bashan. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Bashan, well, Missouri. <laughs> I know they feel special. <laughs> yes. 
But I don't know if people know that Bayesian is like another a pasture. Once the loud cry goes yes. out, then it'll go to Bayesian and Gilead, those other, like to um, the Christian churches and then to um, the heathen. So that's the that's pasture right. that they're for. Uh-huh, go ahead. Yes, yes, you are right, Sister Judy. Those two pastors will be during the loud cry. It's for the Protestants and the heathen in the world. They are to feed on the road message in the time of the kingdom. That will be yes. after the cause of probation for the church, which will be the withering of Mount Carmel, according to Amos 1 verse 2. Thank you. So we can close our study for today. And I want to thank you for participating and for enduring. I've had a problem, challenges to, you know, with the internet here, but this is what we could have for today. And we pray that uh, next time it will be better. So I have a quote in closing from White House Recruiter, page 46. Let's, let's read that in closing. Okay, it's paragraph number two and it reads, it says as present truth adherence in the first fruit period, may God help us all brother, sister to be either among or along with the first fruits, comma, the 144,000. It is left to everyone himself to determine his own destiny and of this, be certain that the only unerring way to achieving eternity is in hearing and in following God's voice, in making your decision in the closet of secret prayer and in abounding in close and reverent study of revealed truth for this particular time. Whereas the surest way of erring and of losing out is to give ear to the voice of men in the place of the voice of God. End of quote. May God help us all. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, brother Obi, and thank you for, for the study and everyone. May God bless you. Thank you.